bringing you in-depth discussion from one of the rad groups of online writers covering the Edmonton Oilers. Are you ready for Oilers Overtime? Oilers. Join us as we talk news, rumors, trades, player grades, game results, and more. All featured on one of the most glorified teams in the NHL. From the great one to the next one. From the boys on the bus to the decade of darkness. This is Oilers Overtime. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of Oilers Overtime. My name is Jim Parsons. I'm here with thehockeyraiders.com. We've got our regular cast with us. And for the first time, I think, since we've done this show, we're actually getting to do an episode right after a hockey game. Normally, we do them before. And we predict some stuff. And we're often wrong. In this case, we're <laughs> actually going to watch a game. And then maybe as you watch this, it won't be fresh. But for us, recording it, we're literally minutes after the Oilers Detroit game. So we're going to be talking about that and some other things as well. And to do that, we've got everybody with us again. Colton Pankew is here. Colton, how are you? I'm good, Jen. How are you? Doing, doing okay. I, I'd be better if the Oilers had played a better first period tonight. But other than that, not so bad. Uh, Julian Mangelo is with us as well. Julian, how are you? I'm good. I missed you guys last week, and I'm loving the little Eastern time zone starts. Don't have to stay up too late to, to watch the Oilers now. There you go. <laughs> and Brian Swain's with us, framed perfectly. Brian, how are you? <laughs> yeah, no, good, good. I mean, you know, you can't win them all, right? So, and and this way, at least we didn't come out looking like idiots from our predictions pregame. Now we can just talk about the game and we can just say that we knew this is exactly what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I wrote an article today saying, you know, how good is the start? Are they going to be all in on the season? And then I said, well, if you if the Oilers can go on the road and go five and over four and one, they're really in a position where they're going to be absolute buyers, even though it's super early in the season. Of course, I probably jinxed the team by doing that. Uh, they don't win. They lose in a nail biter towards the end. I think Jack Michaels, who was doing the play by play on Sportsnet, ran out of gas with his voice. He's just totally gassed at the end of the game. It was close, but the Oilers first period was not pretty. I think they got. By the middle of the second, I think they were outshot two to one or something, but it was just not good. Uh, Colin, we'll start with you. Um, what do you think of the overall performance of the Oilers against the Detroit Red Wings first game on the road, a long road trip coming up here, five games against some teams they should be, but against some teams that might be a little tricky. This was probably not one of those games that we thought the Oilers were going to be the underdogs, but they didn't win here. So what do you think of the overall performance? Yeah, I didn't think it was very good. It's kind of a, bit of a continuing trend right now with slow starts. I know like in the Seattle game um, that they've, they've had a few times where they've kind of come out slow. The Rangers too, they're down four one at the midway point. So I think it's kind of just more showing up for a full 60 minutes. Like I'm obviously not too concerned about it. It's only their second loss of the season, but I think just a, a slow start. And honestly, if it wasn't for the play of Stuart Skinner and the, at least the first half of the game, I think it could have been a lot worse. Well, Brian, I'll go to you next because, you know, Stuart Skinner's your guy and Stuart Skinner gets a start tonight. I thought he played really well. I think the one goal that he let in where he kind of gaffed on the go behind the net there and coughed it up, I, goalies do that. I want to say it's nerves or anything, just a mistake. But I thought other than that, what do you make, like 35 or 38 saves or something like that? He played pretty good tonight. What did you think of the game? Yeah, I thought he did very well. I was kind of heartbroken for him on that third goal because, like you say, I mean, what you know, what do you do, right? That's just uh, just a gaff, a bad bounce. Um, he he kept them in this thing for the first uh, really thirty minutes of the game, and then made some big saves to keep it three nothing at the time too. Before they started the comeback, uh, kept them in it in the third period. I think he got the second star of the game. Um, well deserved. So I think, you know, I think he's made a very strong showing for himself outside of that third goal. And unfortunately that's the one that turned out to be the difference. Well, they certainly didn't ease him in, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're talking about a goalie that hasn't played. He's got the second NHL game on his career and you kind of want to go, okay, well let's give him some looks, but nothing like two. And then what were they like nine to two, nine to three or something? The shots. I think it was 26, 13 midway through the second. And yeah. I mean, in the case, and, and to your point too, that that was his first. He's been up with the team since October twentieth, and I think his last day start in Bakersfield was two or three days before that. So, like, this is his first action in three weeks, on, on top of everything else. Yeah, no, I thought he looked really good. It's unfortunate that he didn't get the win, but uh, I thought he looked pretty strong. Julian, what'd you make of the game? Surprised Brian didn't pump his boys' tires a little more. Uh, I think he was great. Um, 
you know, aside from that one goal, and he was the reason they were in the game that uh, that early and, and and lingering around with with the score so tight, or uh, you know, like we said, uh, halfway through the game. But um, yeah, he, for me, he was kind of the lone bright spot in the game. I just thought they came out sluggish a little bit. Um, it kind of felt like a trap game to me. Uh, you know, you're you're rolling into you know, a, a lot start of a long road trip, you know, um, and, and a Detroit team who's been pretty decent all season, you know, very competitive and underrated, I think. And a lot of teams kind of take them for granted just because of what they've been in the past. So um, a little bit of a, of a trap game to me, but I mean, they, they hung in there and they, they showed up closer to the end of the game, but um, you know, they just, to me, weren't as crisp as they usually are and then felt like they were chasing the game. Yeah, it'll be. It was an interesting story tonight because you've got a game where in the first half the Oilers were clearly not the better team, but the two goals that happened, well, well, the first and the third, Slater Cuckoo costs the puck up 200 feet from his own net, and then they go on two and one and they score, and then the unfortunate incident with uh, Skinner there in the third goal, but the Oilers did not deserve to win the first half of that hockey game. They were clearly outplayed. It was not a good, but in the third period they just completely turned it up. So Colton, I'll ask you this, like, is this good news that the Oilers can do this or is it bad news that they know they can do this? So they don't necessarily come out strong because they're always thinking they're in the game in the third period, they could just turn it up. And they almost won here, which might've been bad news when you look at, I mean, it sounds terrible to say that, but Mm -hmm. if they're going to play like this in the first half of the game, thinking the second half will save them, what does that teach them? Maybe they got to know they got to have good first periods. Well, yeah, it's, it's not a good habit to fall into because, I mean, once you play some of the more top teams like the, the Tampa Bays who, or whoever, maybe I know they don't play them a lot, but just some of those top teams in the league, you're not going to be able to come back if you start slow. And it's kind of what we talked about last week, too. I think um, just the, with the slow starts and everything, I, I, I think they just have a tendency kind of that now they know that they can get back into games. Like you said, like years ago, this would have been if they're down like this in a game, they would have just got blown out or now they're capable of coming back. But like you said, it's not something that they want to make habit of here. Yeah. What did you, uh, Brian, what did you think of the pool RV goal? Now I only bring it up because one, he's still super hot, but two, all that everybody's talking about at Emerson right now is this Bison King thing. And you got to love it. I mean, he fully embraces the personality, the nickname. He dresses like a Buffalo Bison for Halloween. Like he's super into this. He stays hot. So what do you think of the goal one? And what do you think of this Bison King talk? Oh, I'm all in on the Bison King. This is, I think I was saying to you yesterday, this is the greatest nickname that anyone's had in Oilers franchise history. Uh, and and who, who better than to have it than, than uh, Jesse, right? I mean, he just, you got to love that kid. I mean, he just embraces everything. He just, um, he just loves life, right? The world yeah. will be a better place if we were all like Jesse <laughs> Pooley Army. Um, uh, to, to the goal. I mean, yeah, it's, it's nice to see he started the season pretty strong when a few games there without a goal, you, we were talking like what his potential could be for this season. Uh, I think we all agreed he could, he could hit 30. I think, you know, one of us, <clears throat> maybe me might've even called him for 40 at one point in time. Uh, he's back on pace for, I think it's 45 now. So like, it's nice to see that this is, this is not, this is who he is now. Like, this is not, he's not just scoring two goals and going silent for three weeks. Like, and then going back to last season, we're seeing a consistent trend that this he's it's, it's not just uh, a flash in the pan. This, he is a player that the game he's elevated his level to right now. This is who he really is. Well, there were two things I noticed on that goal. Uh, one, his breakaway speed. He got the puck on a turnover and he separated himself. Like he's a big dude, right? And he just distanced himself from everybody else. Not only were they not catching up, he was spreading the gap so he could finish the play. And then two, he looked right at the bench and was like, let's go. As in like, I know this is a big goal. I know this is an important goal. And this is potentially the catalyst for us to make a little bit of a comeback. Julian, did you notice those two things? Like, was I the only one that saw that? Yeah, you could see the 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 passion when he scored that goal. You know, fire, try to fire the boys up, um, and it did it did give him some momentum because I think McDavid scored pretty close after that. So well, last uh, minute of the second and first minute yeah, of the third, right? Yeah, you know what I mean. So going into the room, that's a big goal, um, which is good. And I think just his consistency of play has been has been really well. And I think having him with McDavid has has like just been a a solid kind of duo and not wavered. So. 
Tippett's ability to change everybody else up and down the lineup. But those two guys have kind of been staples. And I think that that consistent play to have that chemistry with either, whether it be dry settle or Hyman on the wing uh, with, with those two, it just keeps that, that kind of status quo and they know what they are and they know what they go need to go out and do. Um, so I think that's helped them a lot this season rather than moving them up and down and him almost trying to find his role still. And he kind of knows it now. And you think you see that more. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, he's, he's going to be dependent on for a lot of big goals. And I think that was just, uh, just the show of it right there. Colton, this is probably a loaded question, but do you think with all the people that are on this team, all the players that you could possibly be below, is Jesse Pugliarvi the most beloved Oiler right now? Like with the Bison King stuff and just how like innocently lovable this guy is. Like, is he the most beloved Oiler on the team? And that's a big statement considering who else plays for this team. Yeah, it's a big statement, but I think it's without a doubt him. I think just the whole story, it's kind of crazy to see like before last season, the a bunch of the fan base that kind of turned against him after the holdout and everything like that. And he's come back and just really just a whole, whole attitude change. I think just everything about him is just, his attitude is just infectious, right? He's just, he just seems like a happy go lucky guy. I think the team really embraces him and yeah, the fans seem to love him too. And then everything like he brought up with the Bison King stuff, he's just playing along with it. So yeah, I think, uh, I think he's definitely the, everyone's favorite oiler right now. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. It's like, and he's embraced it so fully and I'm not sure if, that the teammates told him to embrace it or if he's just figured out that he should because it's not a slant at him at all it's just a lovable thing that they've labeled him with that he just is totally relishing which is awesome that's so good speaking of lovable but let's switch gears a little bit i sent you guys a quick message before we went on the air here and i said if you could make use three or four words to describe because we can't keep going on this podcast without talking about the goal right the mcdavid goal against the new york rangers for those that didn't see it I don't know where you've been, but it was one on four, essentially one on five because he beat the goaltender too. Probably the best goal, certainly the best goal of the year. I don't know if another goal is going to be scored this year that's going to make it even close, but it might be the best goal in five years. Might be the best goal since like a Mario Lemieux type of goal. So if you had to pick three or four words, Brian, I'll start with you to describe that goal, the New York Rangers goal, Connor McDavid. What would you say? You teed me up here perfectly, Jim, because my my four words to describe it are goal of the century. By that, I mean the 21st century, like the last 20 years of hockey. I couldn't I've been having this conversation with buddies for the last three or four days. It's funny. Hey, like here we are now four days on the roof from this and it's still all anybody's talking about. Um, I can't think of a better goal, honestly, that I, I, I probably have seen one, but nothing came to my mind that was better than this in, in my lifetime. And certainly the reaction from it, the fact that we are still talking about this half a week later, uh, I, I think this honestly like stacks up as a top five or top 10 goal all time. The only guy I ever remember seeing scoring a goal like that was uh, Dennis Savard. Um, so that'll tell you how far back we're going if we're, if we're looking, at, um, looking at a timeline for this, uh, the, the quality of this goal. Yeah, I mean, it was something else. I remember seeing a Rick Nash goal one time when he was like deacon in and out of people. I think it was against Arizona. All of the place. I thought that was pretty cool. But yeah, you got to go way, way back to like Mario and stuff like that to to pull out this kind of goal. And just the fact that he tried it, you know, like it's amazing. Uh, Julian, what about you? If you had these three or four words to describe what you thought when you saw that goal, what would it be? I mean, there's a lot of words you could use, but I'm just going to go with one, just say filthy, because I <laughs> like the use of that word. And um, I just think that it, this to me is a goal where, you know, that down the line that you use as a highlight reel clip to start open up hockey night in Canada, you know, you're looking back, you, the one where Lemieux scores against the North stars, they usually open up with hockey night in Canada with, or you got the Patrick wall wink, uh, those little tiny clips that they kind of montage before a hockey night in Canada game. I think that's just perfect for this. And the thing that made it all for all for me was the reaction after the goal from, from McDavid it was just pure joy or pure like shock and awe that he even he was surprised he was able to pull it off and he knew how big that goal was at the time too so um it's just something that's going to kind of become a, a a staple clip for for people to see i'm not sure if it'd be technically goal of the year because you never know what can happen in the nhl these days but it's definitely the front runner right now well if anybody does it it'll be him like if anybody beats that goal it'll be him 
Like there's just, who else is going to do that? Exactly. Like it just, it's unbelievable, but you're right though. The facial expression tells you two totally different stories. Cause he says one thing with his face after he scores a goal, like, Oh my God, what did I just do? <laughs> and then he has the press, the press conference afterwards where he totally, yeah, downplays so, it. he's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, just yeah to you know, I'm just here through. to do my job. <laughs> cool. And what would you use? What words would you use to describe that goal? Yeah. I mean, I guess just unbelievable. Like the words I said at the time, obviously I probably can't say on here, but it was just one of those things like he, you're watching it and it's like he first loses the puck. So it's kind of like, okay. And then you're seeing him come in the zone and it's one on four, like you guys said, and it's almost kind of like, I know it's big David, but still just get it deep and no, just goes right through everyone. And yeah, it was, it was crazy. I haven't seen, I mean, he's scored a lot of highlight real goals during his time in Edmonton, but I haven't seen a goal like that in a long time. Like a Lemieux goal, like you said. That was so one of- for Patrick Nemeth. Yeah. yeah. Well- the one you, you brought up, Colin, I think one of the most impressive parts for me wasn't necessarily, I mean, it was the finish it was unbelievable, right? But the fact that he was a broken play, like he he gets the puck, he couldn't keep the zone. So he comes back out and he's like, oh crap, I was going to be offside. So he dances around a little bit. He waits for the Rangers to sort of not be sure if they want to make a change. And then he sees that opportunity. He even described it. He's like, it was kind of a weird play. Like I've he's seen some people say, like, I think it was Daryl Sutter was like, ah, it was really one on two. Cause the two guys at the top are sort of moving and he went, yeah, maybe technically, but that's why McDavid was able to try it. He says, okay, I'm offside. No, I'm not. I'm good. Okay. I'm going right. Like it was just a broken play that he turned into something else. My words are going to be, thank God says Riley. Morgan Riley is probably the happiest dude in the world <laughs> with that goal scored because he's, I don't know if he's watching it at the time, but he now knows he's no longer yeah. the most. He's not the victim. Like he's, he that dude had to be depressed for like a year and a half every time that goal came up right like because he got burned so bad i mean it's not his fault i mean what are you gonna do Mm -hmm. but he's probably the most happiest dude in the world knowing okay god thank you i'm done i don't have to be (laughs) blame somebody else on his his i know i don't have to be the whipping boy for all of this mcdavid like every meme every gif every whatever because now you can put four Rangers up there plus the goalie <laughs> and you'll forget about me. Right. Like yeah. he'll be one of 10 instead of one of one or the last one that happened. Right. So yeah, I'm sure he was, was super pleased to see that. So yeah, I mean, it was crazy. I well, I, I don't know how many times you guys watched it. I'm sure I've watched it 40 times. It never gets old to me. I can keep watching it. They've just showed it to start the game today. And it's just every time you see it, it, it doesn't, your reaction just like, wow, how do you do that? Yeah. All right. I know that we'll start with Brian on this one because he's a bit of a numbers guy. He does a lot of the numbers for us. Let's talk a little bit about the Connor McDavid. I think you already used the word pace, uh, which we always make fun of ourselves for using at this point in the season. But Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, uh, now I think they're tied, right? Isn't it after this game, they're tied for point lead uh, on the league? So what are they, 23 and 11 games? Well, 23 or 20? each, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what that is for pace, but – it's a crazy amount. Like we were talking, I think at one point, can McDavid get 150? He's well past that in terms of what they're potentially on pace to do. I don't know. What do you think here? Like, I mean, it's a pretty crazy, pretty crazy stat. There's a lot of guys doing point of game paces so far in the NHL, but this is just unreal, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I think they're on pace about a 165, 170 now. So, I mean, they're still well on pace for that 150, but I think it also tonight shows you how, well, McDavid got his point, but Dreisaitl was kept off. And I mean, it wasn't, you know, it's it's so hard to score in this day and age to average two points a night for an entire season. Like even just a couple games like this can throw you off the pace, right? So I think the fact that Dreisaitl, you know, went without a point tonight just makes me appreciate that much more what they were able to do in those first 10 games. Um, like I, I did look at the numbers and we're talking like, Two teammates with 20-plus 20, uh, 20 points in the first 10 games has only happened once ever before um, uh, on, on the Oilers, I should say, and that was Gretzky and Curry. Yeah. Uh, we're talking like guys who scored 10 goals in the first 10 games like Jai Settle did. He's in the company with Gretzky, Messier, Anderson, Curry. I mean, these are all Hall of Fame comparisons, but they're also comparisons from a different era. Like it's they're doing things that we have not seen done in nearly 40 years. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I mean, Colin, do you think they can keep this up? Like, I know that it sounds ridiculous. We say this every time, and we said it last year. Can he get 150 games or 56 games? And he did. And can we get 150 and 82? It looks like he's going to without much trouble. But do you think they can keep, like, can McDavid and Dry settle? And the crazy part is Dry settle's keeping up and not leading him. 
Like, and it took McDavid to get a point tonight to catch Drysdale by one. Like, can they maintain this? Um, I mean, I always feel like I'm the negative guy. <laughs> yeah, you're the pessimist on the on here. So we gotta keep us in check. Yeah, I, I I think I did say last time though that 150, I think for McDavid is uh, is possible, and I, I do think that he'll probably reach that at this point. I I don't want to say it'll be disappointing if not, because that's just an insane season, but it kind of almost just feels like it's a given at this point, which is a crazy thing to say, but whether they continue at this high of a pace, like Brian said, I think it's, it's tough every night to do it. Like Detroit's not the strongest of teams and they were able to keep dry set off the board. So there's going to be some other nights where this happens, but I, I think 150, especially for McDavid is definitely a possibility. And I, I do think he'll get there. Julian, I'll ask you this because the Oilers have what five guys in the top 50 between mm-hmm. McDavid, Drysaddle, Hyman, Puljuri, Nugent Hopkins, who still didn't have a goal, but is I think still leading the league in assists. Yeah. Can does that limit McDavid and Drysaddle's ice time, and does that hurt the potential to maintain that base, or are they just so established that games like tonight happen where you're pushing in the third, you need those guys on the ice? There's always going to be an opportunity to get those guys on. Yeah, it's it's they're they're established. They they know what they need to go out and do. And everyone's gonna have these games from time to time. And I just think that how they bounce back uh is gonna be telling of how their season's gonna go. Because you know, if you get kept off the score sheet one night like dry side will, I'm not gonna be surprised if he comes back with a two or three point game on the next time around, you know, um and make up for it. So uh, I think it's just in their nature and, you know, everybody has some off games and uh, you know, credit to Detroit for playing a good defensive game and um, th- th- those games are going to happen and it's going to happen throughout the league. I just think that the way they've separated themselves from the rest of the league is going to be, you know, kind of shows just how good they have been compared to everybody else. Right. So, um, you know, just, just their ability to, to, to continuously put points up there and they're probably in the locker room teasing each other of who's going to finish the season with more points by the end of the year, you know, and it's like a, a friendly competition between the two, which is good to have too. Yeah. And what they get, was it one or two power plays tonight? Could have been two. two. But the, the first time that they don't think they scored on a power play like yeah. all season, right? They've had at least one power play goal in every game, which is typically where they get a lot of their points. So uh, pretty impressive. All right. One more topic before we close things off today. Um, Julian, I don't think I've started with you. So I'll start with you on this one. Uh, this is the road trip, longest one of the season so far for the Oilers. Um, they're going to go five games. They've got Detroit, which they just lost tonight. Three to or four to two, uh, the empty netter. Boston on the Thursday, Buffalo on the Friday, St. Louis on Sunday, and Winnipeg on Tuesday. There's some pretty good teams in that mix. What record are you hoping the Oilers walk away from with this road trip? What would it be considered if it was a success? Where do you see this road trip going? Well, I'd be happy with a three and two in the five games. I think that's reasonable because um, this is kind of their first trip away you know, from, from Rogers place. So, you know, the, that little fan aspect definitely played up, played up their, their game and, you know, kept them when they were, when the, when they were low, kept them coming up higher. The fans definitely played a part in that. So um, it, it, it's going to be a kind of an eye opening, I think area for them to play in, you know, going down in a building that's a way where, you know, fans might be on top of you too. Um, and I think that's good for their, you know, just their overall team aspect and having to build that adversity and fight through that if they do go down. Um, so I think that's going to be good for them, but I think a three and two split, I think, you know, Boston might be a little tougher of an opponent. I think St. Louis will be the one that, you know, they would, that would be a statement game for me if they could pull out a win against them. Um, the Sabres are also underrated, so you never know what you're going to get out of these teams these days, right? So they've been on a pretty good run. So I think a three and two split will be okay for me. Well, they what do they say? If you come away from a road trip 50 50, it's usually considered a success. So if they get two wins and a loser point, then you're like, okay, well, that's something. Uh, Cole, and I'll let you either have the opportunity to maintain your reputation as uh, the uh, negative Nancy, or you can be positive here and say, oh, they're going to do. What do you think is going to happen with this road trip? Now that they're down their own one out of five. They've got some back-to-backs coming up. They've got all three goalies on the road trip. Uh, what do you think happens here? Um, I mean, I pretty much agree with everything Julian said there. I think the Bruins in years past, I think, are a really intimidating team to see on the schedule. I think this year they've gotten off to just an okay start. 
Um, but like he said, I think the Blues are the, the real test. I, before the season, there wasn't really as much talk about them as there should have been, but they've gone off to a great start. And I, I think they're definitely a Stanley Cup contender. So that's that's the big one for me. Um, I mean, I, I'm quite confident in this team. I wouldn't be surprised if they are able to win all four. But I think, like Julian said, if they can win three of them, then you're pretty happy. Brian, do you think this test is going to really tell us what the Oilers – uh, are because there's been some talk, some chatter that this first 10 games was pretty friendly towards the team, right? A lot of home games, lots of space. And I think you even brought it up. There's been a lot of space and gaps between some of these games. Um, some people are saying they're playing a lot of backup goaltenders, things like that. Does this road trip give the Oilers a chance to really say, no, 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 we're for real. Like this nine and one start uh, was not a fluke that we can come out of here and we can be, you know, 13 and three to open the season, something like that. Like does this road test road trip mean that much? Yeah, I think that's exactly what it is because it has been a relatively soft schedule and that's not to discredit them for their nine and one start, but it's been largely at home. It's been largely against weaker opponents and they've had just the one back to back. So um, you would hope they would win most of those games and they definitely did. So this is a chance to, to go out and play a, uh, it's a, it's a really tough schedule. And I think, I think my one thing that might um, help them too, is kind of get in a rhythm here of actually playing uh, every other night. Like um, they, they've been so sporadic with their schedule here for the first four weeks. I mean, there's been a number of breaks of at least two days between games, right? So that might actually be to their detriment. And, and to the point of everyone who's been saying that they've been playing backup goalies, they've had their own backup goal in for the majority <laughs> yeah, of these games. That's fair. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I think, yeah, this is, this is a great chance for them to make a statement and then hopefully learn about themselves in the process too, and, and gain some, uh, they don't need to gain confidence. So I won't say that, but maybe have their confidence validated. So what, what? Uh, on that ahead, note, though, uh, what, what, what goalie do you guys start next game? Stuart Skinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I they, don't, what, they play. Had they won, I would say maybe Skinner, but mm-hmm. I don't know where Mike Smith's at. Like he's yeah. on this road trip, right? So he's. Well, the Mike clearly... Smith situation is kind of like it's one of these injuries now where it's just like it keeps dragging out and dragging out. And it's, there's not a lot of clarity on exactly what it is. And it's just, I don't know. Yeah. yeah like for me, the Skinner, the Skinner game today is kind of, you know, it, it it gives me confidence to, you know, maybe play him in the second night of the back-to-back against, I guess, yeah. the Sabres, right? Well, certainly get one Start of off games. with Koskinen. Yeah. I would say you'd probably go Koskinen against Boston and Skinner against Buffalo. Mm-hmm. Uh, if if Smith's not ready, right? Like, but would Skinner you even start well him enough. if he is ready, though? Like, would you not just maybe run with those two and then, you know, like that's – to me, that that was – he was deserving of another game. Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's no real, no real reason to rush Smith at this point. Just being there, being part of it. And that was where my point was going to go with this road trip is the one thing I'm very positive about, if I could pick you know, glasses half full or a silver lining on any cloud, is that the culture around this team is better than I've seen in forever. And if we look at what the Calgary Flames were able to do to start the season and where they succeeded yeah. the most was on that road trip. They went on the road and they they just destroyed people. And they went, what, five in a row? And that was all on the road. Those were all road games. And so the Oilers with this culture, with this group that clearly likes each other, wants to be together, is hanging out at home anyway, put them on the road in a situation where they're going to be tight all the time. And you've got now leaders like Duncan Keith on there and you've got guys that are really kind of like, okay, and Smith being on the road trip, right? He's another guy that's going to see like, let's let's make sure that we take the most advantage of this. I think this loss, while kind of crappy, is going to put the Oilers in a good headspace to be like, okay, let's yeah. let's do this. Like, we got to get ourselves on track here. Let's make the most of this road trip. It's the first one we're getting. We're tight. We're friendly. Let's really, really ramp it up. And I, I'm really confident that they'll be able to do that. So I saw what Calgary did on that road trip, and I don't think Calgary – uh, maybe I'm wrong. I don't think Calgary's very good. I don't think they are nearly the team that they have been so far this season, but that road trip was huge for them. And so this road trip could be very big for the Oilers. So if it works out that way, then they'll be in good shape. If they don't take advantage of it and really come together as a team and really bond, then we'll see where it goes. All right. Uh, let's, let's do this before we close it off. Uh, Boston, we've already sort of picked our goalies, but let's, let's predict the game. So, uh, Brian, I'll start with you. What do you think the Boston game is going to look like? What do you think the score is going to be? Four or three Oilers in overtime. 
Three points each for McDavid and Drysaddle. Game winner, Bison King. No, wait. No, I'm taking that. <laughs> He's going to score earlier, but game winner, McDavid. There you go. All right. Julian, what about you? I'm just going to go 5-2 uh, Oilers. I think they bounce back. I think Drysaddle has at least three points. And I got uh, Hyman for a goal as well. Ooh, good call. And Colton? Well, Julian took my 5-2, so I guess I'll go 4-1. I like what you said, Jim. Kind of, it's kind of like a – tonight was almost kind of like a wake-up call, so I, I do think they'll come out uh, flying for that game, and yeah, I'll say 4-1. Yeah, if they have a strong first period, it could be a fun game to watch. Uh, I'm going to – I the last time we did this, I picked Philadelphia to get spanked with those, which didn't happen because Philadelphia beat the Oilers. So I'm not going to be as – you know, blatantly arrogant this time around. I'm going to say it's much closer. I'm going to go four three. I'm going to say it's really close all the way to the end. I hope the Oilers come out like two nothing to start the first, and then maybe they creep back in because Boston's good. But um, I'm going four three Oilers. As far as my winner goes, I don't know who's going to be playing, um, but I was really, really hoping for Perlini to get a goal tonight. I felt really strange about the first period. There was so much bottom six guys playing in the first period. It was like more than I've seen them all season. So I don't know if he's going to be playing in the next game. If he is, it's my not so. It's my Super Bowl prediction that maybe Perlini is going to finally Perlini get a goal game here. Winner, book it. There you go. All right, guys, thanks. I appreciate it uh, for Colton, Julia, and Brian, and myself. This has been another edition of Oilers Overtime on the Hockey Raiders. Don't forget, there's lots of ways that you can check out some stuff. You can join our Discord channel. Uh, you can check out our newsletter. Subscribe to it on the Hockey Raiders. Go to the Hockey Raiders.com, Facebook.com slash Hockey Raiders, and Twitter, of course, at the Hockey Raider. Talk to you guys next week and enjoy the week and the Oilers road trip. Hopefully they're going to be, uh, what, 2-0, and 3-0 and by the time we do this again next week. Yep. See you guys.